This is Mandel Lowe. You're listening to Real Jazz on San Diego's Jazz 88.3. We're here at Jazz Live San Diego with Mundell Lowe. Welcome to Jazz Live San Diego, Mundell. Thank you, Vince. Thank you. Well, uh, congratulations, first of all, on your recent birthday, uh, 90 years old, I guess, uh, <laughs> at the end of April, huh? Yeah, uh, April 21st. Well, uh, yeah. congratulations, you. and uh, you look like you're doing great, so uh, that's good to see. Well, I gained a lot of weight from all of these birthday cakes that I keep getting. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, um, uh, recently uh, looking through the paper, it seems like every other week there was a, a new Mundell Low uh, <laughs> birthday celebration or, uh, or a concert. You seem to be playing a lot, and has that yeah. been uh, real enjoyable? Well, it's just about as much as I want to do. It's... When you get to be 90 years old, your your uh, energy level drops a little bit, so you have to be cool, <laughs> as and, the kids say. And uh, and you're still uh, still doing that, maintaining your cool through uh, through got, all of that. Got to do it. Yeah, it's in my soul. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the band that you've brought here tonight to uh, to Jazz Live. I brought brought uh, a bunch of the best guys I could find. Uh, Ron Eshte, wonderful guitarist. We're going to have two guitars, a keyboard, and, and drums. And, of course, uh, Bill Cunliffe, who is a demon on the keyboards, and uh, my old friend, the, the great tapper, Jim Plank. And uh, tell us a little bit about your history with these musicians. These aren't guys that you've just pulled together for this gig. Well, actually, they are. We oh, really? work together, uh, uh -huh. you, uh, you know, not all together at the same time, mm. but with each other. And, and uh, I, way back uh, when I lived in New York, I did a couple of weekends with Jimmy Smith. And I, could, I got the sound of the Hammond B3 in my ears. And when this came up, I, I, I had heard uh, Bill Conlick play. And I thought, what a good idea. So we put the two guitars together with him. And it's, it's, I don't need a bass player. He's wonderful with uh, what he does with his left hand. And, of course... Jim Plank's going to hold the whole thing together. So tell us a little bit then uh, more about this sound, this organ-based sound, and uh, and why it attracted you so much. Well, it's just the, the timbre of, of the, the sound of the, the Hammond B3. You know, it's so distinctive, and once you hear it, you know, you can't forget it. It's it's there. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this tonight. And now uh, when you were originally hearing it uh, with, uh, you were saying, Jimmy Smith, uh, mm -hmm. who was uh, playing guitar uh, with, uh, with Jimmy at that time? Well, at the time, I think Kenny Burrell was playing with mm -hmm. him, but uh, when he couldn't make it, uh, I came in for a couple of weekends and uh, helped out, as they say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fun. Well, um, uh uh, what traits, you've had such a great long career uh, in jazz, and I'm wondering just in your own words, what traits in you have allowed you to uh, kind of uh, thrive all these years uh, in music and in jazz? Well, not to be facetious, mm -hmm. facetious, <laughs> but I was born and raised on a farm down in, in Mississippi, and anything is better than that. <laughs> so <laughs> I started hanging out in New Orleans, and I heard the guys playing jazz, and I thought, Wait a minute, that's better than, for me, better than country music. So uh, I started hanging out with these guys and playing with them, and uh, one thing led to another. Next thing I knew, I was in New York <laughs> working with, with the big boys. Mm -hmm. So it's been fun. That, uh, that time in New York, uh, uh, that was uh, right after the war, correct? Uh, yes, I went to New York uh, the beginning of 1946. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, to join Ray McKinley's band. Ray was the guy that took over when Glenn Miller disappeared, of course. And when he got back to the States after the war, he organized a band with Eddie Sauter doing the writing for it. And that's the band I wound up in. It was a wonderful, exploratory, uh, adventurous band. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the scene there in New York at that time was uh, undergoing some changes, too, with uh, the, the swing era kind of on its down and, uh, and bebop coming. Uh, what well, was I that like for I you? I spent a lot of time on 52nd Street listening to the incoming crowd, which was bebop, you know, Bird and, and Dizzy and some of the Wardell Gray, some of those guys. And I, it sounded very attractive. And uh, so in the meantime, uh, when I got to New York first thing I did was get a good teacher mm -hmm. and I started studying uh, ferociously uh, uh, orchestration conducting uh, how you do that whole thing and also listening to what was happening with music and I didn't want to go the way some of the older guys said 
we're in the swing thing. They said, you know, I don't like this bebop. It's swing for me. Well, that's one thing, you know, but you've got to progress if you're going to stay in this business and do what your ears tell you. Well, that seems to be uh, that seems to be uh, a very familiar thing, uh, you and uh, with you, in that you have progressed and you actually even branched out. And I was kind of struck by you talking about how you dug in and learned um, not just playing. You weren't just wood woodshedding. You were actually doing writing and composition and those things. What really drew drove you to do to do that part of music? Well, I had been at NBC on staff there and in the news and special events department and. Uh, they were doing specials like Castro's Year of Power, the, the, uh, something about baseball, the marriage rackets, those things that lasted for an hour back in those days. And so I had to score those, those uh, shows. So I, uh, that's somewhere along the line, I went out to California with my family to uh, spend Christmas. And I ran into Jackie Cooper, who gave me a job at Screen Gems as a composer. So it was kind of as simple as that. So uh, I stayed there for you know nine years. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about uh, about that period uh, when you, know, you were in New York, which seemed like the jazz capital of the world, and still kind of does. But then to move to Los Angeles uh, seemed like kind of getting out of uh, of that main jazz scene and coming to to Los Angeles. But that was driven by some other things, like a new job and uh, and work in other fields. Right. Not only that, but I saw that things were dying in New York, jazz wise, and. And they had, had gone down to just two or three places that you could play. Mm. And I, I thought about this very carefully. I have always tried to be a little bit of a businessman. You know, the kicks are one thing, but at the end of the day, you have to take some ruples home in your pocket. Mm -hmm. So that's what, uh, when this job was offered to me uh, at a pretty good salary, I said, oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to, to go back and touch on something that I didn't quite get to before is um, you, uh, before you came to New York and when you were in training in World War II, that experience uh, there, um, and I'm not exactly sure it was down south, but it was in, a, in an army or in a military that was still segregated, but you yeah. had the opportunity to hear music that was being blended at that time too. Well, I was in the army with, uh, this was the Camp Plaché just outside of New Orleans. I was in the army with a fellow named John Hammond of fame, you know, Count Basie, Legend, Charlie mm -hmm. Christian, Mary Lou Williams, and uh, we kind of took to each other, and he, he said, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a black uh, battalion across the street here with some guys in it, like Buck Clayton, Lester Young, people like this, and he says, I'm going to organize a jam session at the officers' club or the enlisted men's club for Saturday afternoon and, and start putting things together. Well, he, he didn't have any sweat because, you see, he had a lot of juice. John Hammond's uh, mother, grandmother was Mrs. Vanderbilt. Mm. So he had going in, he never took advantage of that, but when he needed it, he would throw that name up there and people would back off quickly. So that's how we got involved. I met all these people. We played together. We love together you know mm -hmm. it was just great it was were great. you hearing some new things that you hadn't heard before when you were exposed there well yeah because it, it being in the army coming from the south you know dixieland was kind of what i was doing in new orleans and coming from the south uh, it's either country or dixieland all of a sudden i'm i'm talking to the greatest swing players that there ever was mm -hmm. so i started listening very heavily to them and I decided that's where it is, mm -hmm. for, at least for the time being. Right. Another uh, part of your career that is uh, totally noteworthy is your uh, accompanying uh, vocalists and singers, and that seems to be something that um, has been a, a mutual love. They love having you, and you seem to really thrive in that environment. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in that and, uh, and some of the, the things that that, uh, that that brings out in you and your playing. Well, uh, the way that whole thing started, I was, as I said before, at NBC. Mm -hmm. And in those days, they'd have these little radio shows, 15 minutes, with uh, various girl singers or boy singers. And some of them wanted to uh, sing with the guitar as opposed to the piano, mm -hmm. just to break up the flavor of everything. So I got into that, and I, I realized that... Uh, uh, for instance, I would be given an assignment. That we're going to do such such a tune uh, on Monday on the five o'clock show. Well, I'd take that music home, and I not only learn the music, but I would learn the words 
because if the singer live on the air happens to skip a beat, I can catch her because I know where she is or he is. Mm-hmm. So that kind of grew into uh, the the uh, the accompanying thing, and I think one of my my most uh, memorable times was a CD I made with Sarah Vaughn, uh, George Devine, and I called After Hours. An interesting thing that that record was made way way back at the, the end of the 50s now I do seminars and things like this at the colleges and schools of music and I discovered that in many schools they use that record as how you should listen how you should sing a song and how you should accompany a song which completely surprised me well, what an honor to, to have that as, uh, as part of your legacy well if it helps them I'm all for it excellent um so uh, I'm I'm wondering if uh, you can share with us uh, some artists that uh, you might not have had the opportunity to work with yet that you uh, that you that you might have you uh, have you had that uh, thought about you know what's on your bucket list of musical things to do uh, uh, in your life? Well, back in the, in the, the New York days, you know, mm-hmm. I worked with all the guys there and and the gals, you know, and. Uh, when I got to California, I discovered that there's some good guys out here too. So, one thing just led to another, and and uh, I'm very happy uh, working with them. You feel like you've gotten to 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 do well. You grow when yeah. you, you work with people that that uh, that are saying something different. You mm-hmm. know, you keep your ears open and you listen, and you you take that as a lesson, and take it home with you. Mm-hmm. Have there been any artists that you've wanted to work with that? Uh, you now won't not, have the opportunity. Not too many. Really, not too many. I've, somewhere along the line, you know, I've been doing this now for uh, seventy years, mm-hmm. and uh, it's so I've run across or recorded with or uh, played with yeah. most everybody that I'm interested in, anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, um, it is uh, uh, quite an honor to have you here, and uh, you. and to uh, be celebrating uh, your 90th birthday with you here too at Jazz Live. Uh, Thank you so much for being here at Jazz Live San Diego. Thank you, Vance.